has been said that man produces evil as a bee produces honey, but that no evil can happen to a good man, either in life or after death. He and his are not neglected by the gods. Nevertheless, the line between good and evil is permeable, and almost anyone can be induced to cross it when pressured by situational forces. And thus goes tonight's story, my dear friends, a tale of good and evil. Straight from Dr. Creepin's vault, the subreddit I set up so you could share your stories with me and I could read them all for you. So now, on this fine Friday evening, it's time once again for you to sit back and relax with your favourite drink and listen. Hey Bogdan, how far is that camping site you've been talking about? My friend Yannick inquired from the back seat of my rundown Voxelastra. It was a truly beautiful early afternoon, driving beside the roadside tree line in the north of Scotland. Me and my two closest friends decided to go on a camping trip, a refuge from all the deadlines we had to meet. The weather was perfect, the sky was impeccably devoid of clouds, and the air was still. Uh, not far, really, Ian. Just a few more miles and we're there. <laughs> Will your banger get us there, Danny? Vihan laughed, his face planted into his brand new phone. I can't find a lake anywhere near here. You don't? Really? I thought Google Maps had everything nowadays. <laughs> Did you search for Locke instead? Yeah, still nothing. Vihan looked at me with a sliver of frustration. Road trips weren't his strong suit. One of the reasons we decided he should take the passenger seat at the front. I hope it's close. It's really close, I promise you, my friend. I hope we get there before we die, Ian murmured from the back, winding down his window. Fuck, it's cold round here. Well, my friend, we are pretty much at the end of the world. There's nothing past Perth in the north, our Indian classmate surmised. The three of us met three years ago at the opening ceremony at Edinburgh University. We were equally lost in our surroundings as well. Few others around us really spoke English as we know it. Vihan told me he's from Mumbai, a rather big and gloriously colourful city in India. Yannick was born and raised down in Blackpool, his Polish parents immigrating to the UK some good 30 years ago during the collapse of the Eastern Bloc. At least he understood the locals a bit, and could translate for the two of us. We are a motley crew, aren't we? Ian remarked, looking at the rented camping equipment which kept him company in the back. His long, barely coordinated legs struggled to find a comfortable position. Other times, his well-mended blonde hair would be a magnet for the girls, but now it just looked weird, pressed against the roof of the car. I found it funny how he put a huge jacket on top, but still wore shorts underneath. When we are done with uni, we should go visit your place in Bulgaria. I heard it's warmer there, Vihan joked, knowing full where anywhere else in the world is warmer than godforsaken Perth. After spending three years out here with the reindeers, I think me might want to go to your place, my man. Yannick swung forward, tapping V on the shoulder. Guys, we've arrived. I slowly drove the car off of the smooth tarmac and onto a tiny stretch of dirt road, the final obstacle between us and the promised land. Twenty or so minutes later, cheerfully filled with protest and remarks, we arrived at our destination. A small pristine lake lay there hidden from human civilization, untouched and undefiled. As its waters slowly drifted downhill around the rocks and behind the hill across, we started unpacking our homes for the next few days. I'll give it to you, Bogdan. This place is epic. Ian took in the dense, cold mountain air and exhaled a cloud of steam. The smile finally returned to his face after the stiffening trip. Vihan was still shaking, but he seemed to be regaining his own colour. He was a smaller guy, of darker skin complexion, and with rough, messy hair. 
Nevertheless, he was also in his element in the great outdoors. I'd barely had time to take in the view when he got the tents out. Soon enough, he started issuing orders as to how we were supposed to set up camp. You must be thrilled to finally walk on solid ground, my friend. I turned to him while trying to drive down one of the anchors. It's a simple task, but somehow I was capable of failing it. Here, let me help. He basically yanked the piece of steel out of my hand and, with a single blow of the hammer, drove it in halfway. It's about reading the ground. You're strong. That's my problem. I scratch myself behind the ear. Why, my friend, I'm just helping. Well, if we were having a wrestling competition, you'd definitely win, my friend. I laughed. But why would we have a wrestling competition, Bogdan? What did I ever do to you? V smiled, fully aware I was about to propose something he wouldn't like. Well, it's a matter of survival, really. We have two tents and three people. One of us stays outside and freezes. <laughs> you petty bastard, Ian intervened. Don't even think you can make me and Vihan sleep in the same tent again. It seemed he still bore ill memories from our last camping trip. Honestly, he had a point. <laughs> I got an air mattress for the car. One of us can sleep there. You sleep there, Bogdan. That Astra stinks like hell. Ian smiled in relief. Hell, that's harsh. The old banger got us this far into the wilderness. Show some respect. Vihan quickly gave out a salute in the direction of the Vauxhall. We all laughed. Hey, Votan, why don't you set up the chairs and table? Maybe start something on the grill, Yannick suggested. I'm hungry like the wolf. Sure thing. Any preferences? Anything goes, if you ask me, but... Hey, ask V. He's a vegetarian in the group. Ian smirked. He wouldn't grace a table with his presence if it didn't feature stuff that was moving and breathing at some point. And that sparked a lot of debate with our Indian friend, who was not only vegetarian, but also quite passionate about it. My friend, I packed myself some stuff in the blue boxes. Just... Please put them to cook before you put the corpses on. He glanced over at Ian, who was definitely annoyed. After all, that meant he'd have to wait fifteen or so more minutes before he himself could dig in. Now, don't kill each other, guys. Look, it's going to be okay if you just relax and breathe. I giggled. Hey, mate. You want to be the first victim? Look, just get on with it already. I told you, I'm starving. Yannick had a short fuse, even more so when he hadn't eaten. I decided I should heed his advice and get going. I got the chairs, the table and the bag with the cooking supplies, and set up a small dining area in between two pine trees towering besides the lake. Soon enough, I got Vihan's veggies cooking, followed by Ian's Asda meatballs. He bought well over two kilos of them, which was a bit perplexing. Hey, man. You sure will be able to eat all this today? I was kind of thinking of roasting some corn for myself. Yeah, sure. It won't go bad. It's ball-cracking cold here. Ian looked my way, his eyes fixed on the little gas grill. You're right. And I tell you, I'm a freaking master chef. Just look at them. I pointed at the now semi-done meatballs. <laughs> we might have to fight the wolves over them. Count me in. What? Wolves? You're joking, right? Vihan started scanning the surrounding area. He's an interesting character. I found it hard to tell whether or not he was actually worried or just messing with me. Oh, they're so big the locals call them demons, I said matter-of-factly. You come here not knowing? Well, we're done with the camp, Bogdan. Do you need any help with the car? Ian interrupted. No. The mattress came with a pump. You plug in the lighter. I think I'm going to be okay. <laughs> Good thing you're driving an antique. New cars don't have lighters anymore. Really? I didn't know. Anyway, if you are done, let's dig in. 
It was early afternoon. The table was set, and we enjoyed what was to be one of our last camping trips together. We all had different plans for after we graduated. Vihan was going to go back home and work in his father's company. Yannick wanted to stay in Edinburgh, or perhaps move to Glasgow, but definitely didn't want to go back to his parents' house. They seemed to be in perpetual argument. As for me, I was planning to go and settle somewhere in the south of England, hopefully one day working my way into the city. As for now, well, I had all I could ask for. Good friends, good food, and this quiet, untouched haven, away from everything and everyone. Even the weather was surprisingly good and mellow. It was still early in March, but instead of bone-rattling blizzards and icy rain, we got to enjoy a very still afternoon, only disturbed by our laughter and the chirping of birds. We opened a bottle of wine, supposedly handmade by Yannick's grandfather in Poland, and let the time slip away from us. It was one of those days where all my problems could blur away into the distance, and I couldn't care less about the world around me, just me, my friends, and the beauty of nature surrounding me. It was serene, pure, and I soon found myself lulled to sleep. I shook, forcing my eyes wide open, ready to be made fun of by my companions, but to my surprise, they were sleeping too. Hey guys, guys, wake up. You're going to freeze like this, I said, my voice raspy and crackling. I could feel my heart pounding against my chest, hearing my pulse in my ears. I gulped heavily, unable to shake this feeling that something had happened. I found it, well, creepy that we'd all fallen asleep so easily, especially considering the temperature outside. Ugh, what, man? Ian whined. What do you want? Guys, hey, we all fell asleep at the table. We're going to freeze like this. Vian was still cuddled up against his chair, his short curly hair moving slowly with the wind. There's something weird about this place, guys, I said worriedly, still perplexed by the fact we'd all fallen asleep without even realizing it. Vihan let out a long yawn barely opening his eyes. Ian shook him by the shoulder, which finally did the trick. Oh, it's so nice and warm. I froze. I was trembling so my dizzy mind didn't quite grasp it, but I was actually feeling really warm. I put my right hand against my face, and despite wearing no gloves, it felt unnaturally hot. There's something wrong going on here. We fell asleep without anyone realizing, and now we don't even feel cold? What? The... Um, guess it's okay, Yannick interrupted me, lifting his hand and reaching out for his grandfather's bottle. I don't know, we were just tired. The trip was kind of long, and then we ate. Well, they say clean air and good wine make you feel sleepy. Perhaps you're right. Maybe I got jumpy for no reason. Yeah, man. It's fine, he reassured me, his voice echoing around us. My friends, we were only out for thirty minutes, V pitched in. A little nap after lunch is healthy. Yeah, yeah, of course. I nodded my head, now ashamed at my reaction. I was worried my friends would pick on me for what I'd said. Yeah. Look at the sun, it's almost gone. How about we call it a day? I'm still pretty tired. We can wake up early tomorrow and hike. That's a good idea, Ian. Vihan agreed. He seemed the most tired of the group. I stretched my body, which had gotten stiff from the chair, and stood up. <laughs> Guess I should go and flight the Vauxhall presidential suite. I joked, still feeling really tired. My friends nodded in agreement, and each of us went for their own quarters. The night had just begun, and I couldn't let go of this silent fear, the creeping chills running down my spine, that something bad was about to happen. It was easy for me to prepare my bed for the night, but although I was comfortable, I think I wasted quite a few hours trying to fall asleep. Those questions were spinning in my head, 
trying desperately to figure out what could have caused us to black out the way we did. We didn't even drink that much, especially me and Viha. I thought it might really have been the air, so clean and crisp, that we got a sort of oxygen shock. That was stupid, I murmured to myself. I guess you can really faint from too much of it, but it's still so unusual. And then, a truly terrible thought went through my mind. What if someone had drugged us? That would explain the ease with which we all went under. I tapped on the passenger seat, searching for my phone. With the light from it, I looked throughout my things. Wallet, document holder, even went through my sack with clothes and hiking supplies. Everything was there. That fact, instead of giving me relief, made me even more anxious. It wasn't a robbery, and, well, there was nobody around us for miles, so if someone really did drug us, it must have been one of my friends. Maybe it was an ill-mannered prank, but it had gone way too far. Besides, who and how did they even put anything in my food? I started retracing the events that had unfurled before, but my memory was hazy. My senses seemed to have suffered from whatever had happened to me. Guess that's why I felt so warm for no reason, I surmised, giving a quick and worried look to all four locks of the Astra. To my relief, they were all down, indicating relative safety, giving me at least some moments to react if someone did try to attack me in the night. I activated my phone's flashlight again and looked through the car for any item that I could use in case of an emergency. My frantic eyes stopped at the side of the hammer my companions had used to set up the tents. I grabbed it and clenched it with my fingers. <laughs> I'm just being paranoid. They're my friends. I don't think they're capable of doing something weird like that. Ian, Yannick, is a very straightforward guy. He's the sort to yell at your face, say stuff about your mother, and then apologize just a minute later. He never struck me as the kind to hold a grudge or plan a petty prank like this. And Vian, well, as I said, I often find him hard to read, but at the same time, he's the most harmless guy I know. He was always so passionate about the abuse of farm animals, and well, whatever people said despite him, he'd never retaliate. He wouldn't shout at anyone, even if they were outright swearing at him. Did he... snap? Ian always made fun of his beliefs. It's been years now, and V had never really done anything about it. Maybe he just couldn't take it anymore. Did he know I was going to sleep in the Vauxhall, park some good 30 meters away from their tents? Is he going to do something to Yannick? Maybe not physically harm him, maybe just give him the scare of his life. I guess it would help his cause if I was very sleepy too, unable to react to whatever was going to unfold. Still, that means I'm safe. As soon as I uttered those words, I felt deep, disgusting shame. It suddenly seemed so easy to sacrifice my friends for my own well-being. I spent years with them, but all it took was a bit of doubt, and I'd turned into an animal, solely driven by self-interest. I threw the hammer to the back and tucked myself tight under the blanket. I'd already wasted hours being scared for no reason. I reckoned I'd need my energy for the long hiking tour we'd planned for tomorrow, and unless I wanted to collapse on the way, I'd really need to get some rest. I felt warmth gently creeping across my skin, embracing me and, soon enough, hushing me silently to sleep. Remember. Remember. An old lady's voice. Breaking and sour, echoed in the air. I opened my eyes, shaken to my very core by the fact I wasn't in my car anymore. I was lying down on the same inflatable bed, but it was in a different place. The surroundings were similar, but there was a cave. A small, rocky entrance was leading to a pitch-black hole in the ground. My heart jumped into my throat as I remembered the sound of the old lady. Is this a dream? I said to myself. 
Remember. She stood atop me, her blue icy eyes fixed onto mine. Her hair was white, brushing against the skin of my face, dancing with the freezing wind. Her bony, wrinkled hand held me by the chin, slowly sliding towards my neck. I jumped back, scared out of my mind, shouting, Ugh! I awoke in a puddle of sweat, shuffling to find the light of my phone. I was shaking like a leaf, paralyzed by fear and confused by the inexplicable string of events that I had witnessed in the past few hours. First of all, we fell asleep at the table, and now I had this nightmare that felt so incredibly real. At least I managed to find my phone, and it gave me hope. It was just a few minutes to five. Dawn was on its way. Oh, I don't think I'll be sleeping any more after this, I told myself and started looking for my clothes. Screams pierced the horizon. My two friends, they sounded as if they were arguing over something. Their voices were loud, but I couldn't quite grasp what they were saying. Maybe I was right. Maybe Vihan really did try to pull something up in the night. I guess I heard their screams, and that made me have a nightmare. I felt slightly relieved at the thought that at least I seemed to be in control of what was happening around me, but that still posed many problems. If my friends were fighting, I had to go and try and help them sort it out. But if he had really gone crazy, what could I do? Regardless, I couldn't just stay in the car and do nothing. I quickly put my red mountaineering jacket on and rushed out. In a few running steps... I reached the small encampment. My breath froze. The sight before me being more terrifying than what I had initially imagined. Man, what the fuck? Do you mean you saw her too? I felt a big ice shard slowly slide down my chest, exacting a piercing grip around my core. My heart skipped a beat, my teeth chattering. I knew full well what they were talking about. Guys, I said with shaking voice. My friends looked up at me. I saw her too. The old lady. And the cave. Their eyes locked with mine. Our gaze is heavy with what we were about to say and do. I don't know why, but for some reason we all felt this urge. Like there was something drawing us into this forest at the far side of the lake. I couldn't explain it, and I guess neither could they, but we just had to go. Hey friends, why are you walking that way? V inquired, as Ian and I made some heavy steps towards the forest in the distance. Don't you feel it too? I asked, understanding full well how insane I sounded. After all. There was no reason to go there. In fact, there was all the reason in the world to go the other direction. Get in the car and drive the hell away from here. I do. But maybe we wait until dawn? What if she's still there right now? Aren't you guys scared? I hate to admit it, man, but yeah. I'm scared like an axe-bound chicken, Yannick whispered, undeniably shaken himself. Sorry, guys, I added. I think I have to go. Unable to perceive what force or reason was driving me to run towards the dense, dark forest in the distance, instead of waiting for the dawn and the comforts its light would bring, I sprinted. Step by step, I got closer and closer to the trees, and soon I jumped through the shrubs and into the unpierceable black of the thick canopy. I saw no stars, no moon. Even the weak light of the impending daybreak was not strong enough to reach me, but I kept going. I don't know how or why, but I just knew. I knew where I was going. Not breaking my stride, I emerged through the trees at another clearing, much smaller than the one we set up camp in, but this one had one distinct feature a small, pitch-black hole in the ground. 
eerily embedded in the rock of the hill behind it. I paused, taking a moment to catch my breath, finally out of my trance. My mind was getting clearer. I felt I was coming back to my senses. Soon enough, I heard the calls of my friends. They were close by, searching for me. Yannick was the first to come out of the woods, shortly followed by Viha. Hey man, what the fuck? Like, really, what, what the actual fuck are you doing? Ian exclaimed, unable to shake the same feeling I'd been having. The feeling of something terrible about to happen. Vihan? Well, he didn't say a word. Even without looking at him, I knew where his eyes had wandered to. The cave. Something was calling me from within it. I made a step forwards. No. No, this is a bad idea. Let's go back. Ian grabbed my shoulder. His hand was freezing cold, and he was shaking like a leaf. I... I must go. I forced myself out of his weak grip and ran straight towards the abyssal hole that called for me. My friends rushed behind, desperately trying to catch up with me before whatever force was calling for us took me in. In just a few giant leaps, I'd reached the cave and slid forwards, trying to make the small opening in the ground, the pass to what was surely a new world. My companions jumped after me, trying to hold me back as I was making my descent towards the entrance, but they were not needed. I remember, I stated, my hands planted on an invisible screen on top of the cave opening. Vihan and Ian were flying behind me, driven by chivalry and the blind desire to save a friend in need. The momentum carried them over, the slippery ground underneath denying them grip. Soon their bodies came on top of mine, and all I needed was to move away, barely correcting their descent with my arms so they could safely drop in. As they screamed, their eyes asking a thousand questions which their minds could not put words to, I told them. You were good friends. You have served me well. Now you shall receive a gift. Like a vortex of dark energy, the gateway of the cave sucked them in, muffling their horrified voices and setting them free. Oh, it was such a beautiful night. So many stars shone atop the clearing. The fresh breeze carried the smell of pine trees, and I could hear the gentle rocking of the lake behind me. Master will be pleased, I exclaimed, unable to hold back my excitement. The harvest will soon be upon us. Oh, how blessed the two of you must be to give away your mortal lives for him. Damned be my soul, but I envy you as I cannot. This experience, it was all too tiring. How many years has it been? I keep notes as I always forget after each rebirth. The North always beckons me, but somehow, when I try to write down the dates and the years, my hand does not obey me. Alas, this body needs to sleep once more. I don't have much time left. I lay down, my weary back pressed against the bark of an old tree. I scribble these notes onto paper, unable to shake both the euphoria of what transpired and the weight of my rapidly aging eyelids. I decide to sleep, for when I wake, I shall see my friends again, reborn, given the gift of my master. I must have been out for hours when I came to this interesting sensation. It felt like a tickle, gentle as if someone was caressing my aching feet. I ran too much yesterday. I expended more than what I had. I open my eyes and I look down. There, I see two babies, misshapen, some would say, 
but I call them blessed. Last night they were given a gift more valuable than anything else in the world. They were bestowed with immortality. I bend over and pick them up. They seem hostile. I understand. I don't hold it against them. They are ignorant. Yes, their new bodies hurt. Their failing organs shall bleed and their very soul shall throb in pain. But it's all for a good cause. Master is coming. They should be proud. Even if they do not see out of their blind, grey eyes, even if their mouth shall stay forever dry and hungry, there is no higher honour than doing good by the Master. Rejoice, my friends. You have obtained eternal life, I tell them as I walk them to the lake across the forest. Their weak bones crack and splinter in my hands, piercing their undeveloped infant lungs. They let out tormented cries of pain and agony and blood, but it is perfect. Everything is as it should. Soon we reach the waterfront, and I take one last look at them. They still try to bite me with their missing teeth, a sight I find adorable. Oh, they were so different in life, but now all their beliefs are replaced by a truly greater purpose, and all their foolish squabbles... What the other eats, says or does, now all that is for naught. Embrace the silent hunger, I tell them, walking forward still, soon replacing the coldness of the water for that special feeling, the unmistakable softness of human skin and muscle at my feet. How many times have I done this before? Perhaps a hundred, perhaps a thousand. I let my friends gently slip out of my embrace and watch them sink to the bottom of the lake. As they join the quiet choir of countless children's voices underneath the holy water, I record this message. My aged skin crumbles to dust. Once again I return to ash, so the cycle can begin anew. This life I lived without regrets, and I have yet again served my purpose. In a blink of an eye, you too shall come across this rock, and if Master wills it, you shall have more time, more energy to spare. If so, read my notes. From now, from the past. I wonder how my short existence will compare to yours. Yours truly, yourself. Whoa, I think it's fair to say that that one escalated pretty quickly. Didn't really see that coming from the way it started out, did you? Well, you're a better person than me if you did. Or are you a worse person? Did you have evil on your mind? <laughs> Not that it matters at all, it's just a story after all. And that is the end of another week. But of course, I'll be back again on Monday with more stories to delight and entertain you as ever. Until then, sweet dreams and bye bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>